And Falk is like, how do I find you? He, and John says, just listen. What about WhatsApp? You know, like, right. you uh, know, like <laughs> even a bird. Hi, I'm Shamar Griffith, codename Comic Shams. And I'm Andrew Tejada, codename Arate. This season, we're racing through every part of the Tomorrowverse on yet another DC animated podcast, part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. Welcome to yet another episode of yet another DC animated podcast. My name is Shamar Griffith, codename Comic Shams. And I am Andrew Tejada, codename Arate. Andrew and I have known each other since 1996. That was the year Bounty Hunters the movie was released in Greece. And that movie is about Jersey Bellini, a bounty hunter who forms an uneasy partnership with a rival to capture a fugitive. Huh. I'll actually be down to watch that movie. Mm. I can't, yeah. I guess it also kind of makes sense too. If like I I don't know how Greek it is or it is how connected it is, but Caesarian sounds a little <laughs> Greek to me. It does sound Greek. Uh, there's a he is a bounty hunter, um, mm. and uh, it has three stars out of five. So you three? know, oh, that's pretty you know, good. Maybe maybe watch it. Maybe it's in Greek. I don't know. <laughs> 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 this is for all those like I'm pretty sure it has no no actual Greek mythology in it, but I'm assuming that everybody who's on the Percy Jackson wave is probably like we need more Greek stuff and this is it right here. <laughs> I'm not sure this is the one, but it, you go ahead and try. It. You let us know. <laughs> yeah. Oh man, but speaking about bounty hunters and having to team up and ally themselves with other characters, this it, it's just right now a really weird transition to say that we're talking about. Uh, the first feature-length film within the new Tomorrowverse as we talk about Superman, Man of Tomorrow. This is what kicked it all off uh, outside of the shorts. This is what we got in 2020 right after the devastating losses that we saw in <laughs> Justice League Dark Apocalypse War. Um, check out our coverage on that. You may need a tissue because, man, everybody died. <laughs> mm-hmm. And and for that matter, Constantine House of Mystery. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's <laughs> just one person died, but a lot of times. <laughs> uh, but fortunately, we do have a rebirth. Let's see what I did there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Superman Man of Tomorrow is a PG 13 film. So there's going to be some moments in which uh, it definitely earned this PG 13 rating. <laughs> and with a runtime of 86 minutes, this 2020 animated film was directed by Chris Palmer. Uh, who will later on go on to direct Batman The Long Halloween, which we've covered in the past season. Just so, uh, just to know, for everyone to know, we are not covering Batman Long Halloween this season for the Tomorrowverse because, I mean, well, we already did that homework. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just go back. You yeah, don't even need to be like The Flash and, and run back in time. You can just click the episode on. That <laughs> <laughs> <Kinda> easy. <laughs> um, but... Fun fact, Chris Palmer also did a lot of storyboard art on movies and shows like Voltron, a legendary defender. Uh, your favorite movie, Andrew, uh, Batman Monster Mayhem. <laughs> oh, <joy>. <laughs> <laughs> He's done some other stuff on the Tomorrowverse and as well as Invincible. Uh, but most importantly, he did some storyboard art on the episode of My Adventures with Superman. Oh, okay. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, it works out really well. Um, and he's teaming up today with the uh, person who wrote the film for the screenplay. We got Tim Sheridan. Uh, he's also worked on Batman Long Halloween as well. He did the work on uh, Reign of Superman. And most recently, you can find him working on Masters of the Universe, both Revelation and Revolution. Oh, I hear one or both of them is good. I guess both, yeah. if it got a sequel, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, so this this film was actually nominated for a Best Superhero Movie back in 2021 by a Critics' Choice Super Award. <laughs> I've never heard of this award before. Me neither. <laughs> but it was in a crazy... There was, like, so many other nominees in this, um, especially for this award in particular. It fought against Birds of Prey, Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, okay. I guess technically, <laughs> sure. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, Disney's Secret Society. This is a DCOM. Secret Society of Second Born Royals. Mm-hmm. And the winner of the category was The Old Guard. <laughs> That's a superhero <laughs> movie? Yeah, it's based off a comic book. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, it's a great movie. I, I have no problem with it. I just... Mm-hmm. That's not what I think of when I think superhero. <laughs> yeah, it's, it also is very confusing that, like, this is the only animated film in this bunch. I like to talk to whoever was picking these categories. Are they okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we got the animation services for this film done by Answer Studio and Studio Greta. So they're going to do some work on um, the rest of the universe here in the Tomorrowverse as we see this new design that gives it more of a comic book feel versus what we've seen in the past with like our DCAMU and our Static Shock series and also Young Justice stuff. We're going to see now the lines are a lot sharper, so it does look <laughs> like they're being pulled right from the comic book a little bit. Some people liked it. Some people hated it. You decide how you feel about it. Mm, they can poke your eye out, so don't look too close. <laughs> yeah, it's like Constantine's jaw. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so our cast list is as follows, as we started off with an individual who actually fought against a member of the super family here, as well as a bunch of other DC heroes since their days on Glee together. As we have Darren Chris, who switches his vocal superpowers as the music meister for Kryptonian powers to be Clark Kent Superman today. That is an ideal upgrade. <laughs> that is- it really is, but I do appreciate to see that the fact that this man's just getting promoted throughout the DC universe <laughs> and that also DC just basically pulls from Glee. So <laughs> uh, next up, she's been she's always been on my fan cast list for this character. And today dreams do come true as Alexandra Daddario is Lois Lane. Uh, this son of anarchy leads into heavily. Uh, his role as the son of anarchy because Ryan Hurst drives through like rolling thunder Uh, He's not voicing his Thor character from the God of War games, but today he is voicing the main man, Lobo. Yeah, I can hear that. (laughs) (laughs) Boy! (laughs) Uh, Next up, while I haven't seen too much of American Horror Story, I do know that Spock uh, can get quite villainous thanks to his role on Heroes, because today we got Zachary Quinto breaking bald as Lex Luthor. (laughs) That's going to be the name of his autobiography. Uh, Speaking of villains, this man held it down. As the villain for not one, not two, but three seasons on what I would say is probably Marvel's greatest television series, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Because <laughs> today we got Brett Dalton, a.k.a. Grant, can shoot the legs off of a flea ward, <laughs> <laughs> voicing janitor Rudy Jones, who will soon become Parasite in our film today. Uh, yeah, I still hate him. I still hate him for all the Yo, things he did. Word. Hail Hydra, no Brett Dalton. But if I saw if I saw wars in the streets, it's on. <laughs> uh, speaking of the janitor, we got Scrubs Neil Flynn, who played the janitor on that show. But today he is Pa Kent, and he's working alongside Scandal's Bellamy Young, who is voicing Ma Kent in our movie today. Finally, E. K. Amadi is such a great voice talent <laughs> because his resume includes voicing Umbaku, Nick Fury. Atrocitus in the in the Injustice games, mm. anger rot in the Netflix's Troll Hunters Tales of Arcadia, characters across Call of Duty, Apex Legends, Halo, he Shao Kahn in Mortal Kombat, Aaron Davis and Prowler in some of these Sony Spider Man games. So it only makes sense that such a versatile voice talent plays the shape shifting hero of Jaan Jaan's The Martian Manhunter. For a second, I thought you were going to be like, he's Perry White. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, if that happened, I would 100% be <laughs> It's a petition. We're just going to start working on, for Black History Month, we're going to make every single person in Superman's world a Black person. <laughs> All right, so with that, we're ready to boom tube over to the beginning of Superman, Man of Tomorrow. So we start, like all Superman movies do, with the destruction of Crypt. Wait a minute. The destruction of Krypton, it's its not here at the beginning of the movie. We actually start at a different point in Superman's life? Oh, man. That's so great. <laughs> <That's> great. <laughs> so this time around, we see a young Clark. Him and his friend are watching a movie where there's an alien reveal. And at, during this movie, the friend reacts. You know, he's, he's a little bit nervous, but he also is like, oh, God, look at that ugly thing. And upon seeing this, Clark starts crying. And it gets 
to the point where he has to be taken home by his dad because he just can't process that feeling of being an alien. And this is how people would see him if they encountered and who knew he was. So he goes back home and as his parents are discussing, um, you know, was it right to tell him? Was it right not to tell him? Um, he starts messing around with this Kryptonian triangle. And um, as he is messing around with it, trying to figure out this is the only keepsake he really has to go off of, um, he throws the triangle, which everyone knows if something's not working technologically, just hit it one good time, just smack it around. It'll it'll work. We transition back from the triangle in the past to another triangle puzzle, putting on a tie. Uh, yes, this is this is the thing that's haunted men for years, or just people <laughs> for years. Uh, so he's on a video call with his parents, and they're trying to help him. And he's they're a little worried about him because he shares that for him it's a pretty big day for him over at the Daily Planet, which he we learned that he's interning at. But they're more worried about the reports they're seeing in the paper about the flying man because they know it's Clark. They know that he's out there dressing up creating doing acts of heroism and they're worried about him being discovered and because of typical you know alien uh thought processes of things they're like they're gonna dissect you son they don't say that in the film but we know um and what happens in this scene it just feels so real because they show him the paper on the screen but it's so close up that he has to comment (laughs) that like can you please back it up and i felt like Every millennial who ever watched this movie was just like, yes, this is it. This is this is how I know that I can connect with Superman right here. <laughs> so uh, after this uh, voice call gone sideways, uh, we see that Clark wants to go to work, needs to go there quickly. So he gets to work and his big work is he brings coffee to the team. He's the coffee boy. And in this in this mix of him getting coffee, we also notice someone is observing Clark from a distance. They looked into his apartment. They'll show up here very shortly. But we get distracted by Star Labs' big rocket launch. They partnered with Lex Luthor, and everything looks great, except just like Wells in the Flash series, Lex Luthor is hiding a big secret, which is the rocket don't work, and Lois Lane <laughs> has the power move to prove it. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, the power of voice recording. So uh, she starts questioning him about, you know, how does it feel to have your rocket funded by your daddy's government contract money? And she even reveals this voice recording of, it seems to be like a conversation the two of them had, where he reveals that, you know, he basically manipulated the president into giving him this contract so that they can, he can just make money off of this thing. He doesn't care if it even works. He doesn't care if like, he helps to create new jobs or anything for around there for Star Labs and this rocket launch, this missile launch. launch. So, and even at the point when um, I'm assuming this is Mercy Graves, she grabs the 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 recorder, she smashes it. This is when it's Lois reveals that she memorized every single part of that conversation, including the line that if people chose to live near a launch site, that is their problem. <laughs> I mean, yeah, he's not a line, but he's not wrong. (laughs) So he's he's pressed about it because we do find out that Lois is actually a recipient of the Luthor Journalism Scholarship. I didn't know he was that philanthropic, but okay, Uh, I get good press. (laughs) I mean, that is true. That is true. But he's so unfazed by this that Lex continues to launch. And we see that everyone is kind of like, even though they're trying to get a comment from him about what just happened, what was revealed, um, they decide to just kind of still be in wonder about this thing shooting off. And while this is happening, Clark hears one person that he needs to save, and that's the man who is clearly overworked, Rudy Jones. Because as he yawns, he brings over a coffee that he picked up that he actually saved for himself. Something I learned here is that apparently if you sprinkle in some uh, cinnamon into the grounds a little bit, it really wakes it up. 
Uh, gotta say, I've actually tried this when the movie first came out, and not gonna lie, it does wake it up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Wakes you up to that you should go to Starbucks instead and get your coffee. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he has a nice conversation with um, the janitor, which I wondered why they had him, this man sweeping outside. Like, <laughs> like so it's far. Like, why from was the this building? not cleaned up before the press conference? <laughs> it's too late, my guy. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so they have a nice conversation, and the janitor reveals that, hey, you know, there's some crazy stuff happening in Star Labs. They got containment cells. Like, I, you're looking at space over there, but I think they're already have a, a, a hint at space. And although he, Clark, obviously wants to go in and take a look, the janitor's like, you know, I I, I got kids. I got a job. Uh, the other kid's on the way. Like, I, I can't risk it. But what I can tell you is I've done tours overseas, and somebody over there is shadowing you. So, again, he points out a mysterious stranger in the distance. But before they can address that, Someone screams, look up in the sky, and it's not Superman, it's the rocket just just failing. Like, and I do love here Lex is arrested instantly. Like yes. there's no hesitation. <laughs> he was like, Oh, gotta go. And that's like one step before he was in. Yes. <laughs> so the uh Clark flies up in his makeshift Superman costume and you know, just uh redirects the rocket to the sun. As you do. Mm -hmm. um, and I do like that there's a moment where he just stays there in the sun and just enjoys it. Just like takes it in, uh, absorbs its power, its vitality. I think that's a really, uh, it's something we take for granted, I think. Um, but it's a really nice scene. Uh, too bad not everyone in the city does like Spider-Man. I mean, um, <clears throat> the flying man. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and soon after we realized that not everyone's gonna like uh, Lois Lane because Perry White, who is voiced by Peter Michael, uh, she he she in, uh, he introduces her as the person that all of these new reporters out there needs to be looking up to because he's now hired her, a grad student, not someone who has college experience and internship experience or anything like that, a grad student who was able to take down the billionaire are basically on her first day of the job. <laughs> so now that everybody is kind of like, uh, okay, this kid here, um, they all walk away. And the only per people that are left are Lois and Clark. Clark is looking on for either with like admiration um, because he saw what she did live. So he's just astounded by that. So they get a chance to talk when he heads over to the copy room where he sees that she's working I'm trying to fix the machine that isn't printing. And this is when they have this really great conversation about him asking her, how can you do what you did? And she just tells him that's really about confidence. Like, you know, understanding where it is and what's your place in the world of like how you're talking with the people that you're talking to. And he asked her, well, now that you've taken down the most powerful man, what's next for you? And she's like, but did I though? Mm. And as she leaves, he tries to grab for her papers in the copy machine and sees that her next story is going to possibly be about uncovering the superhero world because she has a photo of this flying man, him, basically in his, I mean, definitely inspired by comic books, but the only thing I can think of is season three, Jordan Kent from Superman and Lois. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, it was definitely those vibes. Um, <laughs> yeah, so he's left wondering, like, what his effect on society is it, it goes right back to that you can see the first scene in his eyes of watching the movie of the alien again and um not literally figuratively <laughs> don't look that <laughs> in the animation um, <laughs> there's a little little nitpick here i have though that mm. um they see batman and um they're like oh a cape is cool <laughs> so it's kind of like batman is inspiring superman to wear a cape which I don't mm -hmm. love that idea. I think it's kind of weird. <laughs> um, it was like that man can't even fly. Why would he even need a cape? <laughs> exactly. So I thought that was a little weird. But anyway, uh, there's another outer space object that Star Lab spots. And Superman goes to confront it, thinking it's another rocket falling out of the sky. But it is time. It is Lobo. And Lobo immediately is like, yo, 
why is the Kryptonian on this planet? Like, what is going on? And Clark responds by throwing him through a building, uh, basically. <laughs> <laughs> and this leads into a, an epic back and forth between the two where they're throwing, Lobo's using weird arsenals like electric slugs. Clark is busting out all the moves because I guess he learned how to fight. Unlike some other versions of Superman, he was ready for the the. Oh the yeah, scrap. I was like, "What the? This man is doing basically like MMA style fighting right here." <laughs> oh no, I was gonna say he was even fighting against that kunai with chains. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't fall for that trap card. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, eventually, uh, Clark calls Lobo an alien, and I love Lobo going, "Bro, you got mirrors on this planet." <laughs> <laughs> what do you think you are? And this is where it's the, the, the further reveal that Clark is indeed the last Kryptonian. So there's a big bounty on his name. Mm -hmm. And he assumes that because of this, he needs to be brought in alive. And Lobo's like, nah, and throws a bomb at him. It's one of my favorite scenes in this film. <laughs> um, so as Clark gets blown away, um, they still continue to fight. He tries to figure out a way to get Lobo away from so much of the, the buildings around the metropolis because at this point, we, I've got to be candid about it. There's so much property damage in yeah. this one scene. <laughs> yeah. Man of Steel levels, we're talking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so Clark, as he's trying to fly away, we hear the report coming through that he's either trying to fly away to get to a safer location or just trying to retreat all this is happening while the people in Star Labs are watching the battle, but Rudy is the one that watches the battle as it's happening outside their window, and he sees how Lobo's hit sends Clark flying through the building, causing the building to fall apart as he's trying to rush people out, um, being the, the hero that he is because of the fact he did serve. He, like, he understands that evacuation is key here. So when... Unfortunately, though, he does get caught in the falling rubble, sending him down into this like lower cavern area. It's actually the same place that Clark was looking at when um, using his x-ray vision when Rudy first told him about the hidden areas. But then as the fight continues, Lobo pulls out this bomb. And when he throws it, it catches Rudy, who is trapped under some rubble and starts to engulf him in this like purple ooze goo-like state and it had me wondering if we're watching um basically power rangers the movie once <laughs> <laughs> i even ooze <laughs> admit it you all wanted to use um so uh superman notices way too late um that uh he is being consumed um and i kind of like this because you know he's still early career so he's not going to be that attentive to things like this mm -hmm. But he does keep trying to fight Lobo, and he ends up kicking Lobo out of orbit, stealing a move from the Injustice video game. <laughs> but Lobo just comes back, destroys the parking lot. I hope nobody had reserved parking, because that's out of the window now. <laughs> and he shows off that he has a kryptonite ring. So with this kryptonite ring, he gives Superman an Invincible-style beating. And this is where that PG-13 is, because that beating, again, would not look out of place on that show. <laughs> um, <laughs> and just when it looks like Superman will die, Martian Manhunter shows up in Martian form to distract Lobo, um, who also is like, another last Martian? What? Um, <laughs> and this prompts Superman to make like Icarus, and but not die. You know, just, just go touch some sun. But the thing that does die is the every single fabric and thread of his clothing. Because <laughs> as he re-enters the Earth's atmosphere, everything gets burned off, revealing the most naked Superman I think I've ever seen in my entire life. And it was also the fact that he didn't care. Like, he, he, was, he wasn't embarrassed. He wasn't like, ooh, oh me, oh my. He was like, yeah, I'm out here. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and these again this is where the starting of the scenes where they started getting PG-13 because <laughs> Martian Manhunter seeing Superman flying from the sky getting ready to punch Lobo with the extreme force of a meteorite uh, he decides to he just basically does that meme where the dude puts up his two fingers and says peace out and just vanishes <laughs> <laughs> um, and as Lobo's getting ready to take the hit Superman stops suddenly midway and in a callback to an earlier scene where Lobo is just like we could easy, either do this the easy way or the fun way when he first met Clark to try to bring him in Clark says you're right 
this was the fun way, and knocks him out so hard that when he picks him back up from like 50 feet under and brings him up, again, Clark is fully naked, and I'm pretty sure that the PG-13 rating was because one man yelled out, oh my God, it's incredible when looking at a naked Superman. <laughs> I mean, a guy's tone, what can you say? <laughs> um, so this prompts back at the Daily Planet, Perry wants alien coverage. Like, like he, like JJ wants those pictures of Spider-Man. He wants those <laughs> immediately. And Lois lets it slip that she has an interview with Superman, but she's going to keep him waiting. And Clark's like, huh. Oh, is that a power move? Is that what you're going you're gonna to do? You can keep him waiting? Okay. And... He, she even goes further to say, I'm going to interview Lobo to get more info on Superman if Superman doesn't get the info. So this really puts Clark in a tough spot. And he goes back home. And unlike other versions of Superman where their parents are like, don't interfere, stay away. Mm -hmm. um, they, they give him an ultimatum. They say, look, if you're special in this world, you can meet that head on. Or keep your head down. But either way, you have to make the choice of what to do. So as Clark is contemplating this, at the hospital, Rick Jones, his organs are failing. They're just ripping out organs without... Yeah. I, I hope there was anesthetic. I didn't yeah, did not look like, like it. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know if it's because they just thought he was knocked out, but clearly he wasn't. Yeah. But these because... organs, PG-13? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we saw a lot. Uh, again, yeah. we see we also see his name. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, this is because he immediately wakes up after they took out I I think it was his spleen. Um again, P yeah, PG there. It was a lot of organs. Yeah. Um, he wakes up, grabs the doctor, and we see that he starts to absorb the life force of the doctor in the room, and then he starts attacking everyone else. Um, they're announcing cold black, cold black. And I was just like, why hasn't no one pushed the button yet? Like I Gray's Anatomy and ER told me there's always a button. <laughs> so unfortunately, this leads to everyone in this room dying. Uh he heads on out, grabs his coat. His wife and child are in the waiting room. They don't see him leave. And as this, we're just pondering what's gonna happen with him. We head on back to the Smallville where the Kents are driving back after doing some errands. But Clark notices something that causes him to tell his parents to stop the car. And when they do, he gets out. They drive up further to the house and they come face to face with the same person that's been following Clark this entire time. Yes. The mysterious man says, hey, so I'm here for your son. And if you don't want to tell me, I'll just like read your mind real quick. So he gets into John's mind. But this is where Clark flies out of the sky, starts to try to give Martian Manhunter the work, but Martian Manhunter is giving that dodge, dodge, dodge. He's just hitting that dodge, <laughs> dodge roll combo. He the ex. first thing that went to my mind was like, counter! Yeah, counter, <laughs> counter, counter! Yeah, so, and he's like, okay, okay, look, we're not gonna scrap right now. I saw what you could do. Can we talk? And as he, they sit down to talk, we see Rick Jones again. He is in pain, He's saying like, yo, this hurts. Everything he, like existence hurts. So he goes into a pharmacy and I know people have been frustrated with your pharmacist before, but please don't touch them on the face like Rick Jones did. And especially don't suck out their life force and then figure out what your medication is. Just ask, wait 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. They got a lot of work to do. Um, but <laughs> he does, Rick Jones steals medicine and then absorbs the life force of two more innocent people. So now his body count is racking up. He's getting stronger with every absorption. Um, all right, perfect cell. All right, I just gotta say it now. All right, <laughs> yeah, all right I'm done. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and we go back to Smallville, where Ma Kent, uh, after sweetly offering blankets to Martian Manhunter if he wants to sleep there, a nice like we accept aliens. Um, they finally have a conversation about. Who you who you is and why are you in my house? <laughs> yeah, so um, the first thing that comes up is that he's grateful that Martian Manhunter jumped in on that fight with Lobo, um, but Martian does share that he's a little 
upset that it got to that point because it meant that he had to reveal his true identity, which he knew was going to be enough to distract Lobo since he knows that he's the last of his kind. But it did showcase the rampant xenophobia that he's been worried about this entire time. He knows that um, humanity isn't ready to accept aliens at this point. So he's really tying into this like sense of self-preservation that he wants. And it's a great conversation from both sides of the debate from the two of them because you have Clark, who's more human presenting, being like, well, we have to share who we are, but, you know, with with certain means. And Martian Manhunter, who's clearly like this more um, comical alien style that we see in the movies, which he comments on. It's just like all the Martian movies are just terrible movies. <laughs> Um, so they're having this conversation and then this is when Jean starts dropping a lot of things like, uh, things about Krypton and saying, calling him Kal-El and mentioning how his father was a great man. And Clark's like, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. How you know my dad? How you know my street name? <laughs> All this stuff. And he reveals that he actually read Clark's mind when he first met, met him because he thought that maybe Clark was a Martian like him, but when he found out about the Kryptonian history from his buried memories from a child, this is when he shows that like he could be an asset to him in discovering more about who Clark is. Yeah, it's a nice, uh, it's a nice conversation they have because they also talk about you know you should remain hidden, like you can't live out here because isn't self preservation our priority? We're the last ones left and. Clark is an optimist. He says, maybe I should reveal. Maybe that will protect us. So mm -hmm. there's a nice little debate they have. And Martian Manhunter is able to access that pyramid, unlocks the memories, where we see briefly the destruction of Krypton. Mm -hmm. um, but not... What? Oh, no, no, not, yeah, yeah. It was a destruction. I mean, not like the planet blowing yeah. up. Yeah. yeah. We didn't spend... It wasn't 40 minutes where we watched <laughs> Russell Crowe jump onto an avatar and... <laughs> And uh, the planet explode, but we get a little bit of it. And, um, you know, March Manhunter further offers, I can help you dig more of this up. But he does re recall that the, his the mom's last words to Clark were, to dwell on the past is to lose one's path. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to be careful about how much he wants to um, surface. And um, after this conversation, John's like, all right, I got some stuff to do. Uh, you know, the new new Invincible just dropped. I got to go. <laughs> and Clark is like, how do I find you? He, and John says, just listen. What about WhatsApp? You know, like. Right. Uh, <laughs> like <laughs> even a bird. You're right. Something. I feel like that was too one way. Yeah. Like, just in my thoughts. You got Messenger, bro? Like, come on. <laughs> like, what's up? <laughs> it's like, Telegram? Something. <laughs> <laughs> but after this scene. Ma Kent gives Superman a suit because he says, look, you can't be walking around naked all the time. Uh, I, everyone's was really embarrassed and, you know, a lot of people were insecure about it. So here's some, <laughs> I mean, there was that one dude that yelled out was incredible, but like, I mean, <laughs> not everyone's going to be that welcoming. <laughs> we can't all compare to Superman. Okay. <laughs> um, so after he, as he gets his suit, Lois gets, a potential harassment lawsuit because Lobo is going wild. Yeah, he starts saying basically reciting every dirty limerick and joke that he could think of to her during their interview. Um, this is troublesome to the ears of Lois and I believe many other people who had to sit through this. And unfortunately, as she's trying to get some more answers, she does ask, the, uh, because Superman has stated a name that she had given to him uh, that he's the last of his kind. And when she asked Lobo of this, he says, yeah, he's not. Uh, there's actually way more Kryptonians on the way, all coming over to enslave you and do whatever they want to you, which he immediately turned real, shows that it was actually a joke that he was just trying to make. He truly is the last of his kind. And when Lois realizes there's nothing further that she can do with this conversation, um, she tries to open up the door to get outside, but she comes face to face with the more vampiric cell, pur purple cell version of uh, Rudy Jones here, who is now absorbed so many people that he's able to get through. And he knows that his next target is going to be Lobo, which is 
going to be pretty clear because, but he still has to face off against like two guards who decide, hey, um, we're going to try to shoot you down by shooting you in the back. Star Lab security. I mean, you're paid not enough and uh, you shouldn't work there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, he came for revenge against Lobo. Fair. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, in the process of absorbing, trying to get to Lobo, he absorbs the energy from the containment cell and turns more monstrous and more and more into an alien looking figure. And while Lobo escapes, Lois certainly doesn't. So Superman has to come in and save her. But he finds, even though he's warned not to touch um, Parasite, unfortunately, even his lasers, laser beams are enough to give Parasite energy. So Parasite eventually grabs Superman, is able to absorb not only his powers but also his memories which i wasn't aware parasite could do um but good to know (laughs) and here is where we get one of the most savage things i've seen since house of mystery (laughs) only one episode ago (laughs) but (laughs) this is where parasite uses superman's lasers to burn martian manhunter alive and you hear it Jesus. (laughs) Jesus. <laughs> it is traumatizing to say the least. It is because at the same time, Superman just has to sit back and watch as this happens. Because at this point, his powers have been drained. Uh, Martian Manhunter's powers were drained as well. So you just see the um, this burning corpse fall to the ground. And then there's like a slight moment in which we see that... Um, Parasite, who I'm sorry, I have to say this, he kind of reminded me of like a skinny version of Barney. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was waiting for it. <laughs> so he kind of hesitates to, as he starts laughing maliciously, but then he stops and hesitates a little bit and then he just leaves. So we jump now to Clark is back in his apartment. This is the world's smallest apartment because I thought at first it was just a room in his in his apartment, but this is the whole entire apartment. This is less than New York City. Like, so he's trying to see if he still has possession of his powers. Unfortunately, when he tries to heat up a glass of water, um, it doesn't really work. So he throws the glass in frustration, cutting his hand. But we see that the super strength somehow has been translated over to Lois Lane, who kicks his door open. <laughs> Because she needs to know whether or not he's safe after finding out that he was in the middle of the attack and he because he gave a a statement to the police. And as she's trying to figure out what's going on with him, why was he there? He starts questioning whether or not he's up to the task of this job. Now, she's thinking it's the job of the reporter, but he truly means the job of being Superman. Yeah, and I, I do like that he has these moments where he's like, I still hear the screams of Martian Manhunter. Um, and this job is so much harder than I thought. Maybe, maybe I lost it. Maybe I don't have that that skill. And Lois, of course, is interpreting this as a, you know, reporting doubts. So, you know, she tells him to, you know, keep going, to not stop here. Like this is just the beginning for him. And after he gets some advice from Lois, he's she's like, oh. You're just here to steal my story, aren't you, Lois? <laughs> <laughs> and, and I love her reaction. She's yeah. like, what? Oh, of course not. <laughs> Figured we could share the bus. <laughs> <laughs> we got this. It's an extra credit group project. Um, <laughs> the biggest part of his her advice is that sometimes you need to talk to someone smarter than you. So Clark realizes he does. And so he quits his job. Sure. Uh, sure and then he yeah. decides to talk to Lex. Lex Luthor, because Lex Luthor is smarter than most of us, and Mr. Terrific isn't around yet. Um, so we get another, anytime you meet Lex Luthor in prison, it's going to be a great scene, and this is no different, uh, because <laughs> Lex is pretty much, after hearing Superman wants to get to space, he instantly goes like, oh, because you're weak, because you need the sun. Okay, all right. <laughs> and when Superman offers to give him money, he's like... <laughs> Money? What do I <laughs> money? Money? I got that. <laughs> it's like all of what I all I wanted to hear from Batman all these years. It's just like I don't need that. Money. Uh, how much money you got? Um, so he does agree 
to help. And Superman's like, how are you going to get out of jail? And Lex Luthor says, I'm a 1% white man. Of course I'm getting out of jail. <laughs> That's the subtext. He doesn't say all yeah. of that, but most of it. <laughs> <laughs> and um, after we get this scene, we cut to a much more emotional scene with our big villain. Yes, because we hop on over to a much bigger apartment uh, owned by uh, Rudy Jones and his wife, where he shares that with his uh, with his daughter and his soon to be born child. They're prepping for the morning. Um, they're getting ready for breakfast. And as his wife steps out the room, this is when he, using the Martian Manhunter powers, reappears. And he's looking at the images that have been drawn by his daughter, Kaylee. Um, most of it is just like their faces done in crayon. And he's looking at it through the eyes of a father that wants to be there for his family. But then when he looks up, he sees that Kaylee has seen him in this new purple lizard-like form. And she screams out loud that causes him to run away out of not wanting to cause any more pain for them. And as he just hears his, the crying of Kaylee, he's just hanging around on the outside of the building. And he just runs away, continues to run away. Uh, meanwhile, uh, once again, Lex Luthor was able to get out of prison because, you know, that other superpower that he has. <laughs> and he enters into Luthor Corp with Superman. And they head on down to, like, what seems to be, like, Luthor's lab. And he, Superman's trying to figure out what can Lex do to get him into space. And Lex says, I can't send you to space. You got no training. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that your secret identity isn't that of an astronaut. So because of that, you'll just die. You're a fragile little egg. And I was like, that you're it's you're not wrong, but you didn't need to read him for filth like that. He is trying here. Lex's motto in this movie is I will be out of line, but I will always be right. Like <laughs> you can't argue with the facts. <laughs> you really um, can't. So he's also able to figure out that the device that turned Rick Jones into Parasite uh, was an EMP that absorbed powers. And somehow combining that with human DNA gave him the ability to absorb powers too. So he figures if he absorbed the strengths of the enemies, he also absorbs for weaknesses. And this is where Clever, Lex is like, okay, so what are your weaknesses? Clever <laughs> thing for him to have in his back pocket. And upon realizing Kryptonite is his weakness, he reveals that behind door number one is Lobo, who he, Lex, got out of prison. <laughs> um, and also gave him a bottle of whiskey. <laughs> yeah, it's a maker's mark. <laughs> and they agreed to team up, all three of them to team up to take down Parasite. And in the midst of this, they go to a power plant, nuclear power plant, where Lobo has called in a real bomb threat. And he's like, <laughs> Superman's own joke, and Lobo's like, I'm not, <laughs> reveals that he has bombs. He's strapped to hell. <laughs> this man got more bombs than that, Um, what was it, the leopard tiger thing from Static Shock? <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> that guy, ah, uh, packed with bombs. Johnny, uh, <laughs> what's that guy, J uh, explode, Rex Explode from Invincible. Rex <laughs> oh, that's, <yeah. laughs> that's the theme today. <laughs> yeah. So at the plant... Um, Parasite shows up. He's bigger. He's hulkier than ever. Mm -hmm. And now it's time for Lex, Lobo, and Soup with probably not the greatest album cover of the century, but it could have potential for them to go into battle. Nah, I'm going to have to give that album cover to Parasite because my man came through like it was Godzilla minus two. <laughs> <laughs> So they immediately jump into battle. Superman starting the battle first as he flies on up to test to see how much of his powers have been recuperated. And he starts off using his heat vision. Uh, unfortunately, Parasite did want the smoke and it immediately sends Superman flying across the power plant. So Lex decides to send in his next asset of Lobo asking him, hey, what do I pay you for? And as Lobo grabs the ring, he grabs his motorcycle he flies up, he starts shooting, he starts sending all of his weapons out, and he jumps off the motorcycle. He is pummeling Parasite. And Parasite's just like, I eat those like a cereal for breakfast. <laughs> you do not have enough badges to train me. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. Okay, we're going to make so many <laughs> dragon jokes. I love it. <laughs> also, what is Lex paying, Lobo? What, what currency? Whiskey. 
<laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's a great currency. <laughs> Especially because I'm pretty sure that Lobo could drink it in just one gulp. So yeah. Lex is probably getting like cheap whiskey for him though. Probably like Keystone to him. So at this point, uh during the battle, Lobo realizes a major problem. Kryptonite isn't working. And this is where Lex realizes that there must be a limit on how long Parasite can retain a particular strength or weakness. So upon realizing this, Lobo says, well, I got these bombs anyway, right? <laughs> and explodes onto Lobo, onto a Parasite, leaving no little trace, but just his remaining body parts. <laughs> um, and this is where Superman's like, okay, I'll draw the fire of Parasite but please come up with a plan. And Lex says, I'm going to get a ring. I'll make a quick call and uh, I'll see ya. And as we, after we linger on Lobo's body regenerating, we see that someone's been on hold for 45 minutes with the White House, which <laughs> honestly, probably not the worst case scenario. Yeah, this is one of the reporters who we were introduced to earlier, uh, Ron Troop, who was voiced by Eugene Bird. Uh, first thing you may know from 8 Mile, but we know as Andy Diggle, a.k.a. John <laughs> Diggle's brother, in the Arrowverse. So it's really all coming full circle here. <laughs> He's been on hold for 40 minutes trying to figure out what to do and where to go. But Lois grabs the phone, <laughs> turns it off, and tells him, hey, the story's out there, so we gotta go. And we don't know where they go or how they get there. But we do see that Superman is still fighting Parasite with everything he got that he has. He's letting Parasite absorb so much of his power. And as Lex is ready, he grabs the ring, he puts it into a gun, he it starts to illuminate green. You think that Lex is gonna do the right thing, but it's Lex, the man who stole 40 kicks. <laughs> deep cut, deep my, cut. Yeah. My favorite math problem. <laughs> uh, so Lex ends up showing that he figures that the most powerful people in the world right now are right here at this power plant. And he questions, who's more powerful? The person that got turned into this monstrous being that can absorb anything or Superman? And he's like, well, nope, it's going to be me because I have the gun, this magnifying pulse rifle. Um to take down both of you. And he starts hitting Parasite with it and he immediately knocks him out. And then he starts firing on Superman. And just when it looks like he's about to get Superman that kill shot, we get another green thing popping out of nowhere to do some damage. Yes, just like pretty much everybody on Young Justice, Martian Manhunter reveals he faked his own death and is ready to get back into the fight. So... For a second, it looks like Superman's going to volunteer to take the kryptonite ring like BVS um, in live action and defeat the monster. But Martian Manhunter is like, bro, are you crazy? No. Do something else. We're not doing that. <laughs> All right? <laughs> Wonder Woman could have taken the kryptonite spear, guys. Just yeah. just thinking yeah. about just, it. Just thinking about it, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Or you could have thrown it. Forgive you. (laughs) Almost every single one of y'all had enough strength to throw that and pierce the hide. Don't tell me Batman didn't have a gadget for this. Come on. Um, (laughs) Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So this is where people step up on the bridge, ready to fight Parasite. Good luck. Um, <laughs> this is the worst version. Speaking of Spider-Man, this is the worst version of the that ending of Spider-Man 1. No, y'all were not going to win this one. At you must be one of us. You must be one of us. <laughs> that was a man on a glider. This is a parasite. You're not winning. This is a Godzilla. <laughs> yeah. So upon hearing that, you know, parasite absorbs not only powers, but feelings, Superman thinks, okay, if you absorbed me and my feelings, maybe you have a heroic sense in you. So he tries to appeal to Rudy, the Rudy inside Parasite, to remember who he is, to to embrace the good in him. And he's like reminding the crowd, like, you guys don't hate aliens. You're just scared of us for being different. And here's where I'm like, I'm not sure of this strategy because Superman just drops his origin story in the middle of it. <laughs> 
Yeah, so say like, let me address xenophobia by revealing that I am an alien real quick. <laughs> Interesting strategy, Cotton. <laughs> and you would think it will work. Um, but no, because as soon as Parasite took a step, everybody continues to throw things at him, including someone who throws a crowbar, followed by someone who throws a Molotov cocktail. And I need to know who was carrying that stuff in their car if you needed to evacuate from the city. Saying I guess some Gothamites that were rolling through town. <laughs> They're always ready. It's like, you never know what you got to throw down. It's like... There's some other calmer weapons you could have gone with. So as they are still trying to take down Parasite, the thing that we all see, though, is the nuclear power plant that Lex had set, apparently, I guess, like, turned on is now going to a critical state. He even looks over at my hunter. It's just like, man, you should have let me turn that off, huh? <laughs> so as they're trying to figure out what to do superman tries to fly over unfortunately he had almost all of his powers absorbed by parasite so he just continues every time he gets out the water and flies up he falls right back in um no one can do anything so somehow it uh parasite rudy jones was appealed to in that desire to want to help save people because uh, we did see that in his mind flashback, he does see when he was helping to save um, his fellow soldiers, when he received a Purple Heart. So Parasite starts walking over and then immediately takes flight all the way over to the power plant and starts to absorb all of this energy. And honestly, I would say if it wasn't for that scene, I would have just assumed the scene of him seeing that he was a hero. I would have just assumed that he probably was just absorbing it for more power. Yeah, but it's revealed that as his body starts to mutate as he starts to absorb this Superman is trying to tell him to stop but he does absorb it all his body bubbles and he drains all the nuclear energy which turns his full body into stone yeah and I, I I do like that they don't spell out whether it was him in the end if it was Superman's influence they mm-hmm. kind of leave it ambiguous but he does end up dying to save and superman really does feel bad about this uh you know he definitely wishes there was another way and um after in the aftermath of the scene um superman is a little mad about the martian manhunter faking death thing and martian goes so yeah i I get it uh you know i'm not a fan if if someone did that to me but i love how john is like oh i'm sorry but i needed to save your ass Hey, got him, got him. <laughs> and Lobo is also revealed to be fine. As he's immortal, apparently. Um, and they say, oh, yeah, I became immortal after I killed all my people. <laughs> Just kidding. And I do like that he also throws in, by the way, I say that lasts of your race thing all the time to drive up the prices. But I've seen a couple Martians. I've seen a couple Kryptonians. It, you're not don't you don't think you're special. <laughs> so uh john is like really surprised to hear this and this lobo takes off superman looks over at john and says hey you should probably go with them maybe you might be able to find some more of your people and martian manhunter offers this same invitation to superman and he states no i know where my people are they're right here as slow as lane who is finally i'm assuming this must be like fifty thousand steps because this girl came up like she had just ran uh, two marathons back to back. She's here for her interview with Superman, but in a nice little callback from the earlier scene in which she said that she was going to keep Superman waiting and even cancel on the interview, he decides to cancel this time around, says that we need to reschedule and flies off to kind of do like a little paraded route around the Daily Planet as he's hearing everyone cheering for him. Um, but immediately as Lois Lane comes back downstairs, Clark is there asking her, he's like, hey, how'd the interview go? And again, nice, wonderful little callback about the importance of power moves and how effective they are. Yeah. If you want to be a dick. No. <laughs> <laughs> or what you're not going to have me do is run up all them steps and then cancel the interview. <laughs> but uh, yep, that's it. <laughs> mm-hmm. As we figure out if Lex is still in prison or not (laughs) 
Uh, we'll leave you with this podcast from the Forgotten Entertainment family that you should be listening to the next time you're not listening to us. Hi, everyone. Master Jedi Colleen here, co-host of Bohemian Geek Studies and yet another Star Wars podcast. But I'm not only a podcaster, I'm also an author. My second novel was published last fall and it debuted as number one horror novel on Amazon, which was really cool. If you like Stephen King, weird happenings in small towns, or just looking for a new writer, give my novel The Falls a try. It's set in Minnesota where everyone wears that nice facade. Nothing is ever what it seems. Find The Falls by Colleen McMillan on Amazon and the Between the Lines publishing website. So, uh, Superman, Man of Tomorrow, the first feature-length film within the Tomorrowverse. How many naked Superman are you giving this film? <laughs> a solid seven and a half. Um, <laughs> that no way... No- no matter how I would have said that, it's going to come out slightly wrong. Yeah. But <laughs> PG thirteen. <laughs> but I, I think this movie is really solid for the the subtle things it does. It doesn't run back to the beginning, just like Batman. We ne- the we never need to see <laughs> Bruce's fans die again. We don't yeah, need no. to see Krypton explode again. So I do like how it just runs past that and really dials down on the xenophobia Mm -hmm. uh, Clark is concerned about and the, the backlash and everything that he's really worried. And there's a nice journey. It goes on of his fear and apprehension and seeing parasite and then being embraced. Um, So I think this, the shape of that is really nice. I really think the vo- vocal performances are really solid. I What holds it back to me is I think it could have gone further mm. um, a little bit on the the themes of xenophobia, especially when it comes to Clark, because while he keeps, he always says in the movie he's scared of being rejected, he never really gets fully rejected. I mean, yeah. there's some news articles that are like, is he a hero or a menace? Which is fine. Mm-hmm. And but it's still it's still like six degrees removed. I think my RT alteration is a scene which I thought was going to happen but never did, where Superman is rejected. That's all. I just want to see yeah. the public, um, after he loses to Parasite, just like point and laugh, you know, or like say you're you're a piece of garbage, like just something <laughs> so he has a visceral th- that everything his concerns are validated, and then he rises above them because. Mm-hmm. The way the movie shapes it, it's like, he's concerned, he's concerned. Oh, nothing to be worried about because he looks like a human guy. Um, And, you know, they try to do it with like, oh, he points to Parasite. It's like, that's the human. I'm the alien. I get it. But I think it would have been more effective to that message and then made it land a little bit more by the end if we had a scene where he got rejected. And... um. The other thing holding it back for me is I I don't part well two more things all the comparisons <laughs> each to one was a point deduction I can yeah. tell yeah <laughs> <laughs> like there you go almost there um there was a lot of this weird running joke about getting his look inspired by Batman his cape mm. his his like costume I think that's just a weird thing to do people are like that nice Batman Wh- what <laughs> universe you talk about Jensen Ankles. <laughs> that guy won't even take a Robin. Like, <laughs> leave your orphan in in a di- di- different city. Like, um. So, and then the last thing for me that was didn't really stick the landing was the ending. Mm-hmm. Um, I like the idea of Martian Manhunter flying into space to find his people, and I, the cheeky Superman Lois exchange is fun. But I thought in a movie where you had such great themes, such powerful, um, writings. That I thought it would end on something a little bit stronger than mm. uh power move. <laughs> so, you know. <laughs> but overall, it is a solid Superman entry for me. What do you think? I agree. I'm also giving this a I'm gonna just do one half point down of a seven out of ten. Uh, because I also agree that it does a great job of like retelling the Superman origin story. Um, I felt especially in this that like we're seeing a very humanized version of Clark. It's like a version that like, I truly actually feel that I could connect to. Um, especially because in the last like 10 years or so, we quite haven't gotten that much because once Smallville ended, we immediately jumped into this like 
Superman's most all powerful being whatsoever. And then like Supergirl kind of touches on that, but again, it's not Clark Kent. And we don't even see that from his character really when um, he gets introduced into the Supergirl series. But 2020 just seemed to be like the year of just like, let's get people to reconnect with Superman. So I felt like it did a great job here. It felt very much with what I liked seeing in um, Superman and Lois, where it's just like, here's mm -hmm. a Clark where it's just like, you see how he's trying to connect with people. You see how he's trying to build a life for himself. And it's Clark. It's not Superman. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate the fact that we get a chance to see um, like all the stuff of him growing up of just like how afraid he was, even as a kid, to share who he really was um, and how that like tied into like his own idea of like, is it okay for me to actually show my true self? And it felt nice to finally get that from him after all this time. The thing that I felt like it just falls short on is I got three things. The least one, the least like the thing that I kind of like just rubbed me the wrong way was just the um the same thing about the ending. Felt weird to end it on a power move kind of conversation. But then the outro song was really dramatic. <laughs> that it, felt, it did not feel uplifting at all. Like it felt like as if I was just like, oh my God, did Clark die? Is this like the end of our world? It was just like, I, I don't know where they were going with it, but it just did not feel inspiring after it kind of ended on a very inspiring note <laughs> surprise it's all-star superman <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i just it just felt weird to to finish this movie and then just be like um did someone get hurt because <laughs> lois because clark pulled the power move or because like lobo decided to go off and martian decided to go it felt very finite um the other thing that i kind of felt like it fell short on was just like Clark talking about being a reporter like the entire first half of the movie he's just like I want to be a reporter I want to learn how to do this he's even going to Lois and talking it's like how are you able to do this and I know that later on it translates over to his job as Superman but it feels like that all that just gets completely wiped away I feel like we could have just easily had it be that like he wrote the article show that he wrote the article about everything that happened at the power plant mm -hmm. like let that be his story and then lois having the story about this is superman revealing himself to the world we don't get that at all so it feels really weird to end it then whereas it's like clark still doesn't seem to be a reporter and then lois seems to have been knocked down the peg at the end of the film after she's been trying to get her feel her, get better about herself because of the fact that like she's been pitted against everybody so it does mm -hmm. feel weird to have it be that, like, he doesn't have a true growth outside just accepting his destiny as Superman, which he had already accepted at the beginning of the film. It's just like, he just got a costume change. That was really just yeah. it. And didn't he say, like, Lois don't publish the story after she published the story? <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> it's just so much that it just felt like there needed to be some fine tuning about how the world of newspaper journalism actually works <laughs> that it just felt a little awkward and speaking of stories that just felt a little awkward i felt like Marsha manhunter's death the this quote unquote death served no purpose <laughs> because like it felt in the scene it's just like it's right after he talks with clark it's just like hey man i'm gonna teach you everything that i know about krypton and i know like the gut-wrenching moment is that like he now sees that he's lost this person that might have helped him along on this journey um but then he comes back and it's nothing nothing really helped like he immediately leaves right after so it's like he's not helping clark either way and a lot of the strong moments that we saw in that conversation that they had about self-preservation and xenophobia like i can understand if it was like and this is my my alteration that I wish that did mm -hmm. happen was that like after the battle when he's about to lose show that the hint, the hint would have landed better about him absorbing a uh, parasite absorbing weaknesses if Martian Manhunter was already on fire and then that's when he backed away mm -hmm. Superman was able to blow out the flames and try to pick him up pick up Martian Manhunter and fly away somewhere and then Martian Manhunter is like see this is exactly why I didn't want to get involved because 
I'm the last of my kind. And already it felt like maybe even have like some people still look off and look on mm -hmm. in fear about that battle and seeing two aliens. It's like, even as I'm trying to help everybody, they all were still kind of rooting for my demise. So mm -hmm. I don't want to be here. And then that's when he leaves. But then have it see, shown that like when Clark reveals to the world that he's an alien, Martian Manhunter is watching this interaction. And when he sees that Clark isn't able to head on over to um, like fully fly over to the nuclear power plant, he's able to pick up Clark from the water. But as he's trying to figure out what to do next, this is when we see that um, parasites don't want to jump on ahead to save the mm. day. Yeah. Oh, I love this. Yeah, I love this. Like, it, it, yeah, because then everyone can see him siding with the alien and they're like, oh, is Superman working with the, the aliens now? Like, mm -hmm. oh, we could get both two in one shot. <laughs> like, yeah. In Scooby just, way. Yeah. yeah. It just feels like Martian Manhunter didn't really serve a purpose outside of just explaining to Clark that he's Kryptonian, which Lobo basically <laughs> explained for him yeah. during their battle. So it's just like, uh, here I am explaining who you are, but just from a different point of view where I'm not trying to kill you. Mm -hmm. And to have him, like, quit the battle because, you know, for self-preservation, it still works. Like, him in Superman's room, he's like, his depression could have been like, oh, should I do this? Because I, mm -hmm. if I die, there will be no more Kryptonians, and I'm not good at it. Like, oh, man, why didn't they do this? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll tell you, we should be running DC. I'm just, <laughs> <laughs> well, not right now, running it, running it, but like, you know, just put us in the room. Yeah, hand <laughs> us the mic, hand us the mic. <laughs> um, but yeah, those are the things that kind of like knocked it down just a couple points for me, just because I just felt like there was just some things that just needed a little bit of tightening on the screw. Um, other than that, I love this movie for the fact that it does feel like you could connect with this Superman from even the small moments of him, like having that video call with his parents, um, understanding that like now that he's not, he's no longer a child, he has to become uh, a man that has to make these decisions. And that conversation was great. I feel like the conversations they dialed in on perfectly well executed. They just needed some work on some of the character development. And uh, speaking of character development, that just jumps us right into our comic book knowledge because we have so many comics to cover for this one. <laughs> uh, not quite as many comics as we had to cover for the uh, Flashpoint storytelling. Uh, today, we're covering two comic book collections, two series that came out, mini series, because Tim Sheridan shared that some of the, the two comics that helped him most influence his storytelling here were Super 2016 Superman American Alien, and 2003 Superman Birthright. Uh, so breaking it down, we'll start first with Superman American Alien. This was a 2015 to 2016 six-part miniseries written by Matt Landis, um, who was also the director of Chronicle and American Ultra. Oh, okay. What a resume. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so each issue, he teamed up with a different artist uh, to tell the story of like how Clark became Superman. So it starts off really well, where it's like a lot of the the titles for each of these issues that do kind of connect with like creatures or beings with wings. So as if they're taking flight and the issues that I saw that were added into the movie were issues. Um, oh, sorry. It's not a six part series. It's a seven part series. Um, and it's issues numbers one, four, five, six, and seven. Um, so issue number one, which was called Dove, this is what covers Clark as a kid. Um, that same scene that we saw in the beginning of our film where uh, he's with his friend Pete Ross and they're watching a movie about aliens. He gets very distraught over the fact of like the aliens, how people's perception of aliens as they come up on screen and he's worried about telling his friends, even at this young age, that he's an alien. But the thing that really wraps the comic together is that the entire time we get a chance to meet this like very young, maybe like six or somewhere between six to eight year old Clark, whose powers are now developing. Like it opens up with him taking flight and his mom holding onto his legs mid air, trying to pull him back down. Mm. Um, his father is able to find a way to catch him, but he's able to, um, Clark is able to protect his mom from getting hurt because he takes the, uh, most of the hit as they fall back down to earth. 
And this is when he's just really scared of revealing himself to his friends because again, they were all watching this movie and were saying how bad aliens are. And because of that, he has a moment where he runs over to the bathroom and completely destroys the entire place. So when his father comes to pick him up, he's like, you know, you can't keep acting like this. You can't, whenever you get upset, the only people who destroy things like this are jerks. Do you want to be a jerk when you grow up? And when Clark says no, this is when his father decides, all right, I'm going to help you learn to control your abilities better. And their first moments are like him carrying Clark up like dirty dancing style, running <laughs> through the fields, trying to help his son to learn how to fly. And this is basically the first comic um, where it's just like he's showing him even when Clark does have a moment when he flies but still can't control it. Uh, he works with someone who has a plane on a nearby farm to grab, use like a a stick as they're flying to help Clark grab onto it so he could pull them back down to Earth. Fun fact about this universe, pretty much everybody, in, almost everybody in Smallville will soon learn that Clark is a, a Clark has superpowers. No, uh, well, yeah. Get it out of the way. Yeah, it was kind of hard to, to hard to like actually hide them all away. Uh, issues two and three, uh, they're very adult. So we'll definitely say that. So they don't end up popping up in the, um, in the movie, which rightfully so would made too much of a, a leap. But in issue two, he um, stops from people from terrorizing like someone's home during the home invasion. Uh, he ends up killing them. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and then in issue three, it's something kind of similar. Um, he kind of now enters into actually not similar at all, because once he decides to leave home, he flies off. But he ends up in a plane incident where it crashes into the water. He's able to save the pilot, but he ends up on a yacht where everybody thinks he's Bruce Wayne. <laughs> okay. And the party is being thrown because it's a birthday party for Bruce by Oliver Queen. Uh, okay. <laughs> so this whole entire issue is just basically Clark partying, pretending to be Bruce Wayne. He ends up... Um, falling for someone who is basically another DC character, uh, another villain in the future. Uh, but this is where he decides, like, it's time for him to grow up and learn everything. And this is where issues four, five, and six, and seven kind of, like, dive into this. First starting with um, issue four of Owl, where um, he ends up interning as a at the Daily Planet. We get introduced to Lois Lane, um, but once again, it's time jump. So he meets back up with Oliver Queen, who thinks he's still once again Bruce Wayne, because they're at a press conference to announce that Bruce Wayne, Oliver Queen, and Lex Luthor are the new are the next generation of powerful leaders and billionaires within the world. So they're hmm. trying to see what are they going to do, collaborate together. What, what mixtape are they dropping? You're saying? <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> Uh, issue five, Eagle, is basically our movie here because this is when um, it's revealed that Lex was doing some experimentation on someone named Rudy Jones, uh, who we know to grows up to be Parasite. During the events, somewhere between the events of issues four and five, um, Clark ends up fighting against Batman because he ends up getting a tour of Star Labs, but he ends up talking with this kid, and this kid ends up to be ends up being Dick Grayson. And as Batman's wondering, what are you trying to do with Dick Grayson? The two of them fight in Superman's home. And he's able mm -hmm. to rip off the cape. And he's just like, oh, this is a pretty cool cape. I think I'm going to take it and use it for myself. <laughs> I mean, I, I, okay. I like that version better. <laughs> yeah. And it actually sticks on to him versus the stuff we saw in the movie. <laughs> better than those wings. <laughs> <laughs> And we get a really cool design um, because he's added the cape onto his costume. It's now long. It's no longer that leather jacket he's wearing. It's more of a um, kind of like a football chest plate that he's put his S logo on. He's still wearing the aviator cap. But then an eagle is when he works with like the police department of Metropolis because now Parasite has gone full force and is attacking everybody. And it's a really cool look. And actually, if you should ever look, check it out, it's really nice because it's like it's a different take on Superman that's just like very like homemade suit Superman, but it looks kind of cool for him. Hmm. Uh, issue number six is when, uh, again, since most people knew that 
Clark was Superman back in um, Smallville, uh, some of his friends come to visit, including Pete Ross. So they come over, they're hanging out. Um, they're worried that Clark might have gotten a big head because not everybody loves Superman. And it's shown to be real because Clark is trying to show them all around. It's like, hey, this is where I go to. You know, I know the streets more from the sky than I do on the on by foot because I am flying around it so often. And as they're talking about this, unfortunately, it leads to an argument between him and Pete. Pete being upset about the fact that Clark was able to get out there. And Clark's just like, well, no one told you to stay in Smallville. So as he flies away, this is when he gets captured by two Green Lanterns, Tomar Ray and Abin Sur. Oh, some heavy hitters. Mm -hmm. And they're the ones that reveal to him that he's a Kryptonian. Yeah, I guess it's okay that Lobo did it, but <laughs> I guess like, Green Lantern's just chilling, like, hey, might as well, we're in the area, right? <laughs> right, basically. Um, so they, again, in this comic, he's also naked. Uh, so <laughs> they send him back down to Earth, um, he's trying to figure out what to do. He and Pete have some reconciliation. And by the next issue, the last issue of the story, when he's fully adopted the Superman persona, he's painted his suit to be more of that red and blue. This is when he comes into this final alter altercation with Lobo and the two fight. And it's a drawn out battle, the same level of property damage, and even almost ends the same way. Thankfully, his suit doesn't burn off, but he does send Lobo sailing through outer space when he pummels him to the ground and then super whips him up into the stratosphere. Damn. that You're not recovering from that kind of whiplash, unless you're a mortal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> way, he was, but he was definitely not coming back anytime soon. <laughs> uh, so that was Superman American Alien. It's really cool. The artwork for it, every single cover art for the issues are just really cool because there's even one that I've always liked seeing was just like Superman kind of beat up as a kid. Um, like a young adult where he's like, apparently he got arrested. <laughs> <laughs> so that's always kind of cool to see. And then the other comic that helped to inspire it was a 12 part 2003, 2004 story by Mark Wade uh, called Superman birthright. So this is, this comic was put together because again, this was like at the beginning of the 21st century, um, people wanted to hear a more modern telling of the Superman origin story and this is what we got. Mark Wade was able to put together 12 story, 12 issues of like him, a little bit of showing Krypton's destruction, of course, because apparently you have to throw that in. All um, right. Yeah, I mean, you have 12 issues. I feel like I was going to get thrown in somewhere. But we do see uh, many of the key elements that we saw in our film today, such as when his mother gave him the suit. Um. Clark's dynamic with like meeting people at the Daily Planet and even that sense of xenophobia. This is where it really died into it because the more that Clark learned, even having that little pyramid hologram thing, the more that he learned about Krypton and the more that he wanted to share, the more he found out that there's a possibility that the Kryptonians might come back. And people found out about this, including this is what I'm assuming was pulled because of what was happening in the in the ish, um, episodes of Smallville, this relationship that Clark has with a young Lex Luthor. And mm -hmm. when the two of them kind of get together and become friends, Lex starts diving in, learning about kryptonite and the meteors and all that. And it's with the possibilities of his powers and the connection to Krypton. Uh, he's able to use that once they get, when once both of them get older, to use that against Superman to show that like how bad it would be if an alien presence actually came into the world and many people are aligning with this. So this sense of xenophobia is so strong to the point where people are creating ways to put blame on Superman and all of that, um, those newspaper articles that were seen on the daily planet, Lex is able to manipulate scenarios. So it looks like Superman's the one that's always in trouble. Who's always the menace. So I can see why the movie was trying to allude to that kind of stuff. But I do agree. I think maybe we kind of probably could have expanded on that a bit more, much like how this comic did. Um, so you could definitely check out more of the xenophobia conversations in here. However, it's not going to be as like we're going to hear from both sides, like how it was for Martian Manhunter and for Superman as they had that sit down conversation in Smallville. Mm. So, yeah, that's uh, basically it. 
But the biggest thing that came out of this one from my research about it was the fact that, I mean, I heard about it, but I wasn't too sure uh, if it really was. But James Gunn uh, for the 2025 Superman, which at this point has been casted for most of the characters already. Um, we're, we already know who our Superman, our Lois, our Lex are going to be. Um, also our Green Lanterns and a <laughs> bunch of other characters. We know who our Tusk is already. Don't right. worry. <laughs> Uh, he is going to be pulling from Superman Birthright alongside All-Star Superman and Superman Brainiac uh, to craft this story. So given the fact that, like, I feel like we've covered two of the three here, I guess. Um, how are you feeling based off what you've seen in this film? Is there anything that you would like to see put into this live action adaptation of any of these stories? Naked Superman. Um, <laughs> He's like, you heard it here first. Cor Cords West, I think is his name. <laughs> if I mispronounced that, get to work. <laughs> now, just think, uh, I, I, I'll i say this, uh, and it's definitely a reflection of where we've been as a, not just Superman, but in general. I need my Superman to smile. <laughs> I need him mm. to be happy to save people. I need him to not, yes, it can be a burden sometimes. Absolutely. But I need you to say one person while you're smiling. That that's what I want to see. I want that sense, that energy that he wants to do this. Um, not that he just has to or feels obligated to. I want that. I want to do this. I want to be happy um in the sun as Superman. So that's the number one thing I need in the next Superman movie. <laughs> what do, what do you want from these uh stories? Yeah, I I mean, besides naked Superman is more smiling. Uh, <laughs> I want also these fun moments of just like seeing the human side of Superman, seeing him um, learn to connect with people. Because the, the two things that pop up in both in um, Superman Birthright and American Alien is like him trying to develop friendships with people. Sometimes it is to like hide his identity. Sometimes he is open about his identity. But I think that we've at a time lost track of that and we got more attracted to like the the suit being present than mm -hmm. the man being present so i kind of really wish that we get a chance to just to see these fun moments like these more iconic things that just like even the small details like addressing the fact that like lois um sometimes needs spell check from clark in her mm -hmm. in her stories and really diving into like the dynamic because I love the way that Alexander Dario kind of plays Lois Lane here. I think that we could expand on the story being told here, seeing more of like the people in the writer's room and talking with them. Like these are the things that I feel popped up in a lot of the older Superman storytelling, but we just lost in the last decade or so. So, and it's a, it's, a, it's something that I think I always say for even like for Batman, it's like the hero. Yes. The hero is the the main person, but he's not the only person. Mm. There is such there's been years of development of these characters to the point where their world isn't just four walls. It is what, it is, what I'm saying as it is. It's a world. So where are the people in this world? So I'm hoping that we get a chance to really dive into a lot of great character development for the people that help to influence Superman to show that, like, they are a part of his life in these great ways because from what i'm seeing in what i saw in american alien and in birthright was that all of his choices his next steps wasn't because he just decided to do it it was because he talked with someone who gave him some advice and i feel like we need more of that mm -hmm. yeah not just uh zod showing up and Breaking the world shouldn't be your only thing. <laughs> yeah. and, and not just a, a man, a billionaire in a suit of armor, um, just happen to say in the same <laughs> name as someone that's a relative of yours. Like, no. Uh, so with that, that's going to wrap up our episode here. Uh, join us next week as we continue on in the tomorrow verse as we cover uh, Justice Society World War II. Uh, it's a very flash focused series. So be sure to support us on our Patreon. Uh, you can check us out on our socials for updates on episodes. And of course, you can always find us across all podcast, flat, uh, podcast platforms and YouTube. And remember to take care of yourselves because the best way you can do that is probably by investing in damage-proof underwear. 
you don't know when your powers might activate if you mm. have them. So just assume that the cost per wear is probably cheaper than an indecent exposure charge. <laughs> For a second, I thought we got a sponsorship there. I was like, oh, and who's going to provide it? Um, <laughs> it's like fruit of the loom, depending on yeah. if they have the cornucopia or not in the logo. <laughs> yeah, and also, if you are working inside of a building and you see something fly through the ceiling, get the half out. Like, mm-hmm. it ain't worth the check. Like, you might end up as a parasitic monster. So <laughs> get out of there. <laughs> Especially if you end up looking like Barney. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks again for listening. Yet another DC animated podcast is a proud part of the Forgotten Entertainment family. If you liked what you heard, leave a review and share us with a friend. Also be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts and on social media at YADC Animated Pod.